This is episode number 179. Today we're featuring the man who probably has trained more top artists than anyone in America. We're talking about Craig Nelson. This is the Plan Air Podcast with Eric Rhodes, publisher and founder of Plan Air Magazine. In the Plan Air Podcast, we cover the world of outdoor painting. Called Plan Air, the French coined the term, which means open air or outdoors. The French pronounce it Plan Air. Others say Plain Air. No matter how you say it, there is a huge movement of artists around the world who are going outdoors to paint. And this show is about that movement. Now, here's your host, author, publisher, and painter, Eric Rhodes. All righty. Thank you so much, Jim Kipping, and welcome, everybody, to the Plein Air Podcast. Golly, 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 it's almost July, and this year has just uh, slipped away. This is the year that disappeared, 2020. Man, I, we're going to look back on this with a lot of interest. I hope you're having a good summer and able to get out. And most of all, I hope this finds you healthy, well, mostly out of quarantine. And let's all do what we can do to keep from spreading all this nonsense. Anyway, of course, I hope you're painting. I hope you're doing lots of painting this summer. And I'm doing more than I, I think I have any other summer. So it's fin- finally uh, something that's happening. I've been staying close to home and painting around the property. And it's just really nice to get some painting done. Uh, quickly, I've got a couple of reminders for you. The last chance to enter the Plen Air Salon Art Competition is on the 30th of the month, June 30th. And you could win $15,000 The cover of Plein Air Magazine, other cash prizes, and, uh, of course, monthly prizes. If you win any category, you're entered into the national competition. We will provide the winners, uh, announce the winners at the Plein Air Convention coming up in August. So you enter any painting. It doesn't have to be fresh. Any painting. It doesn't have to be Plein Air. We have studio paintings. We have figure paintings. We have still life paintings in a lot of different various categories, 20 or 21 of them, including a seniors category, a youth category, etc. Anyway, you can enter at plenairsalon.com. That's plenairsalon.com. Also, a uh, last chance to win a seat to the Plein Air Convention or the Figurative Art Convention. You get to choose. Uh, we're uh, giving away one in the month of June. We'll give it away July 1st. I'll announce it on my daily on Facebook Live at Eric Rhodes. Anyway, um, if you want to enter, you can enter by the 30th. June 30th, you got to enter and enter at Streamline giveaway.com. That's streamlinegiveaway.com. Also, in case you have not heard, uh, you can be part of a historic, historic first time ever event, the world's first Plen Air virtual conference. It is called Plen Air Live, and you can watch from the safety and comfort of your home. This is great if you were not ever able to come to the Plein Air Convention, or maybe you can't this year, or maybe you just, uh, you know, for whatever reason, you don't have the the ability to put it all together to come or have the money or whatever, but you can grow, be part of a community, meet other painters, see top instructors for all over the world. And it's an incredible lineup. Some of the world's top plein air painters, including Scott Christensen. Hmm. Wow. Sherry McGraw, Jill Carver, Joe Paquette, Catherine Statz, Kevin McPherson, Lynn Boyer, Albert Handel, Mike Hernandez, Jane Hunt, Kathleen Hudson, John McDonald, Paul Cratter, Charlie Hunter, John Potoshnik, uh, Nancy King Mertz, John Stern, Carrie Curran, Jim Woodark, Susie Baker, Laurel Daniel, and more, 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 more. And, and a brilliant international painters teaching you for the first time. So like Leon Holmes is going to be teaching from Australia. Haiti Joe Summers is going to be teaching from England. Antoine Passenard from France and Rose Schuring from Holland. Uh, It is so cool. You're going to see demos. You're going to see talks about painting, instruction, critiques, roundtable discussions, 
Uh, and there's going to be a really cool round dis, uh, roundtable discussion about uh, the, the state of women in the world of plein air painting. You're going to like that. And we're going to do live painting together. We've got a whole new way of doing it. It's, you, it's something you've not done before. I think you're going to have a good time. Plus, we're going to be connected to new friends, feel like you're part of the world plein air painting movement. This is the first time the world has come together like this. This is so cool. All the plein air painters in the world, you want to be part of this. This is art history in the making. And rather than having to spend upwards of $3,000 on tickets by the time you get your ticket, your airfare, your hotels, your meals, expenses for the Plein Air Convention, which, by the way, a lot of you are still coming. Thank you. Uh, and it is still going on. But uh, for about 10% of what you'd pay, you're going to get the best instructors in the world and, and four days of content. It's a four-day event, optional fifth day for beginners. And the Beginner's Day is all about, you know, all of you who have interest in plein air but haven't really explored it, you want to learn more about it, learn what materials, how about the easels, how painting outdoors is different. And we got a whole day devoted to that kind of thing, and that's an optional. And you can actually attend that without attending the other thing, but you're going to want to attend both, actually. Anyway, it takes place on the 15th through the 18th of July. The Beginner's Day is the 14th of July, 15th through 18th of, of July, and you need to get signed up now because it's coming up fast. You can learn more at plenairlive.com. That's plenairlive.com. Live online, but not live in person, right? plenairlive.com and get that ticket reserved uh, because we have to get our, our what we call our streaming positions booked so that we can book space for enough seats and so on. So uh, coming up after the interview, uh, I'm going to be answering your art marketing questions. But first, let's get to the... Um, <laughs> lost my train of thought there. First, let's get right to the interview with Craig Nelson. Craig Nelson, welcome to the Plein Air Podcast. Thank you very much. And where, where do you live, Craig? I, I seem to remember you're out in the Bay Area somewhere. I am 50 miles north of San Francisco in Sonoma County, Santa oh. Rosa to be exact. Oh, man, I love that area so much. It is such, talk about a painter's paradise. It's incredible. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, if I were going to go back, I lived in the Bay Area for 10 years. If I were going to go back, I'd go back there. That's uh, because that's, that's where all the painting needs to take place. I've got a lot of paintings I haven't finished yet. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Well, we, it's all wine country up here too. Plus, we got it. We have got a wonderful coast that most people don't know about. So yeah. Well, uh, it's it it is a ideal place to paint. And do you get out and do a lot of plein air painting? Not as much as I'd like, but yes, I do. In fact, I was just uh, uh, I, I'm sure you know uh, Hui Han Lui, and he was a very good friend of mine, and he lives about a mile from me, and we've just been talking about trying to go out uh, any day now. So. Yeah. Well, I, I know, I know how it is, you know, you get busy and all of a sudden uh, those, the best plans get occupied by some other thing that comes up. So, well, yeah, let's, that happens. so why don't we kind of start from the beginning? Cause uh, you, you know, you have a, a huge reputation. I, I would say that I could probably safely say that you probably have taught more people plein air painting than any person on earth because you've incorporated in your curriculum in, in all the teaching you've been doing. So tell me about, uh, give me a little feel for your career before we go there. How did you begin painting and, and how did this all start for you? Well, I started as a young child, basically. No, I was, I was always interested in drawing and, uh, um, I was a, in, in early high school, I was a mad magazine character wanting to, be like that and then as I got to be closer to a senior in order to impress uh, girlfriends I um, got into portraiture and started doing pastel portraits and from there uh, and I found a love of doing figures so uh, and doing things that are obviously a little more realistic um, it drove me down to uh, Art Center College of Design which is where I went to college where I went to school four years there graduated as a kind of a dual major painting illustration uh, graduated, we had nothing, I mean, we had wonderful technical training, but nothing to give us any idea of how to go out and, and earn a living doing this stuff. So being in Los Angeles, I, when I got out of school, I, uh, had a lot of figurative work and I went to the record album companies and, uh, MGM records hired me to do two or three album covers and that led to other things. And eventually I got into doing film posters. So any album and, covers uh, that we might know? Oh yeah. I'm, one for Neil Diamond, two for Sammy Davis, 
uh, Natalie Cole, uh, Shirley Bassey, Solomon Burke, I'm trying to remember, Lou Rawls, um, the Everly Brothers. And, and were, you do, myself, were, but, were you doing <laughs> portraits or were you doing the graphics? What, what exactly? No, did... the portraits, the paintings. Oh, really? The paintings. Yeah. Wow. And so I did uh, a whole bunch of those. And uh, that led me into doing film posters um, because a lot of the record companies were linked with, like, Uni Records was linked with Universal Films. And so they brought in art directors. And so I started doing film posters. And it kept me from doing any gallery type work uh because it was lucrative very very lucrative um and i was i was literally busy from the day i got out of school which is like 1970 until i kind of started to hang it up and move into fine art to around 1988 and uh what happened is i just kind of got tired of it i i there was still a lot of work to be had i was just i had two very good friends uh, dan mccaw and john asaro who um, were both just getting going in painting and fine art. And whenever we get together, um, they'd go back to painting and I'd have to go back to an illustration. And so I finally said to my wife one summer, I said, I'm going to take the whole summer and I'm going to do nothing but paint. This was around 88. And uh, I remember her coming into the studio saying, are you having fun? And I just turned around and looked at her and said, this is why I got into this. And I never looked back. I literally uh, just kind of weaned off the commercial work and got a lot more involved in gallery work. During that time, I was still painting. I, I don't want to say I wasn't painting. I just wasn't exhibiting. I was just painting and had kind of a cachet of right. of works that I had done, and, and I was teaching workshops, and, so and I was when, teaching at Art Center. And, and I started teaching. Oh, you did? Okay, so that's where the teaching it, began. Yeah, what happened is when I was illustrating, particularly um, – I was working almost 24-7, and, you know, you're a hermit, uh, other than your clients you talk to, and I felt like I needed to talk to other artists, and so um, I got a phone call from the school that I had taught at Art Center asking if I'd come back and teach a kind of a painting from the model class, and I jumped at the chance, because it broke my week up, got me involved in, with talking to other artists, and um, it was just, it was really wonderful. And eventually that led to teaching two days a week. And then they tried to get me three and I just, I said, no, I can't do it. I just, I still, I'm still an artist who teaches, not a teacher who does art. Well, there's a big distinction there. I'm curious. I'll go back to the commercial illustration era. When you were doing album covers, movie, co movie post posters and so on, were you doing those from photographs? Did you, did you pose these people and uh, draw from life? What what was that situation like? Were you meeting any of the these? Only, yeah, the only one I did from life, I did a George C. Scott uh, called The Savage is Loose. And um, they gave me photos. I did all the photos. And Trish Vandeveer, who was his wife at the time, was a, the co-star, wasn't happy with what I did. And so I actually went over to their house one afternoon and drew her from life and did my piece from that and she approved it and everything went fine no most of the time the only ones i met lou rolls i met sammy davis um but it was just sammy davis i met him basically because he wanted to explain the kind of wardrobe he wanted he wanted to wear and uh so what what happened is i would i usually was given headshots and then i'd have to come up with my own interpretation of it, any body movements that i want and often i'd grab a friend or use myself as a model and uh so it was a lot of kind of combining one thing with another. Film posters was all the only one I did one called uh, Monster Squad, where I was actually able to pose the kids, and uh, and I think I did Mac and Me, where I was able to pose something. But other than that, no, that you actors. I mean, we were looked at truthfully as kind of the low guy on the totem pole. Sure. If you think about it. Yeah. Because, uh, you know, we just we filled a void that was needed. And uh, so we were given, and it was almost all black and white back then. It was a black and white photo. So we had to learn to invent our own color and things of that nature. But it was, honest to God, it was a wonderful learning experience because I got paid to learn, so to speak. Well, and what they, what they tend to ignore, but uh, obviously somebody knows, is that if that album cover isn't right, if that poster isn't right, that movie doesn't sell. Yeah. Yep. And if you're fortunate to do something uh, that 
went well, a lot of you get a lot of accolades, and if it didn't go well, you don't get a lot of down. You just basically don't hear much. Well, I, I did guess. a few Broadway plays too. That was kind of I did two for Neil Simon, and he bought the paintings uh, for for his own collection. So that was kind of nice. Outstanding, so. outstanding. So okay, now now we have you at Art Center, and you're teaching. What happens then? Um, I was mainly teaching figurative, and it's it's interesting because I really wasn't schooled well in landscape. I was schooled in pretty much figurative. But as I started painting for myself on my own, uh, whenever I find a lull, I realized you had to put those figures somewhere unless you want to just put them against a, a simple tone. And uh, I want, I was got, found it very intriguing. Uh, during my uh, time at Art Center, I was able to travel. I'd take off six weeks in the summer and we'd go to Europe. And that did it. I hit the museums, and I saw great art. I saw art that I went, I just looked at that stuff and said, that's what I want to do. That's what I want to do. And um, so that really inspired me. And I started looking at the environments when there were figurative art. And so what I did is I started, I used my children. My kids at the time were small and uh, took them to the beach and I was living in Southern California, and so I'd, I'd go and I'd do a little painting on the beach, and I'd have them pose for me. And or my daughter's a natural; she's a dancer, so she I, I didn't even have to tell her what to do. And so I started doing a la Soroya figures on the beach, and that kind of started it. And at that point, I started putting my work in galleries, and things started happening, and which was really nice. And but the the fact that I had figures in an environment got me intrigued with the environment, yeah. uh, and so then I just started sometimes doing the environment with no figures, and and I still bounce back and forth, and um, I'm always looking for something new. I'm always looking. I try not to over repeat myself, which again, from necessarily a marketing point of view, that isn't great, but. It's uh, it's who I am. So. Well, I'm not so sure that's such a bad thing. I, you know, I remember having a dialogue with Fred Ross from the Art Renewal Center one time, and he showed me this really marvelous figurative painting. And, and he said, Eric, what's wrong with it? I said, it's, the landscape is awful. He said, exactly. <laughs> he said, I went back to this painter, and I said, I can't buy this painting because the landscape is awful. He said, if you want to make it, you're going to have to learn landscape painting. And so I have been... You know, that kind of informed me uh, very early on the importance of, of, of plein air people, uh, landscape yeah. people learning the human figure and human figure people learning the landscape. And so I've been trying to kind of incorporate a little bit of everything into these conferences so that, you know, there is at least one figure painter there or there is uh, somebody teaching landscape at the face conference, et cetera. Yeah, that's, I, I, to me, uh, as, as an instructor, um, I try and tell our students constantly that um, if you want to be a landscape painter, practice some figures, practice some still lifes. If you want to be a figure painter, practice some landscapes. One helps you with the other. And uh, who knows, you may find um, you start out with, as one and end up as another. I mean, you know, some of these guys that I know personally because I either had them as students or I've, I've known them, are wonderful figurative painters, but they've chosen just really to concentrate more on landscapes, and uh, which is which is great. It's it, tr truthfully figurative is it, it takes a, a different kind of discipline simply because you're dealing with anatomy proportion. Landscape is so much more freeing for me. I just enjoy the heck out of it. I was speaking with a, a friend of mine, John Poon, uh, recently. Oh. About a year ago, and uh, John had been a student of mine years ago, and when I was doing mainly figure, and I told John, I said, you know, John, I think if I could make my living, if I, if they forced me to choose one thing, and I could just make my living doing, I, it would be plein air painting. And John said to me, my God, Craig, I'm really surprised to hear you say that. <laughs> and I said, it is just pure joy. It really is. So did you, once you started plein air painting, going out to the beach and so on, did, did you just kind of self-educate in terms of that, or had you had any instruction in landscape? No, I self-educated. 
You did. Self-educated. Yeah. Yeah, basically by looking at art, looking at great art. And I, every time I'd have a show um, in a town, wherever it was, I'd go around and I'd look at, at the galleries and I'd look at people. Uh, I, I had the chance to look at what I thought was great art um, or great landscape. And so that's really where it came from. And truthfully, it's practice. There, you know, um, we had a young student recently saying to one of our instructors, uh, well, you know, I don't think you're telling me everything because I'm just not as good as I want to be. I'm just, I think you're holding back. And the instructor said, and he told me this, I thought it was a great line. He says, no, if you want to learn how to be a great painter, you've got to paint. You've just got to paint. No shortcuts. And you learn from painting, which is true. I mean, great instruction, workshops, all this is wonderful because it's inspiring and you get helpful hints. But there's nothing like you sitting down and just hammering, you know, fighting your way through a painting. Got a great, I got a great line I use um, that was given to me by a fellow painter. And uh, he said, um, every artist needs to learn how to make frustration your friend. Because it's just part of the experience that you go through as you're learning, no matter how good you are. Well, that's absolutely, you know, it, it's true in everything. It's true in marketing. It's true in life, right? We're, we're learning from our mistakes. It makes, it makes total sense. So you, uh, I, I want to understand how you ended up in the teaching position you're in now because you've been there, what, 20, 25 years? 30. 30. 30, 30 years. So in that 30 years, uh, you, you have trained uh, a, lot of, a lot of people that we know as big names today who started out yeah, with you. Yeah. Um, so tell me about how you ended up, uh, where you are now. I got a phone call. Um, my wife and I, at that point, I was looking at strictly getting out of the LA area because I was known pretty much for my illustration work and I just wanted to move. I had, I had, I considered, I did my time there. I didn't, it was a wonderful place to live, start a career, but it wasn't where I wanted to live my entire life and raise a family. I wanted to be inspired more. So we began looking for, for I was going to move up north and completely quit teaching and, and just pretty much rely on my painting. And uh, I got a phone call from uh, the Academy of Art asking if I'd like to come up and um, take over their fine art department because they said it was a mess. It was, by the way. Um, it was completely, completely conceptual. Uh, there was no training in terms of skill building or anything of that nature at that particular time. And uh, the president was a little bit of a visionary and seemed to know it. Um, so I, I said, well, this plays right into our hand because we were kind of looking at moving up there. So I said, um, here's the deal. I wrote up a curriculum because I had, I had been on a curriculum committee at, at Art Center of what I considered an ideal curriculum. In other words, I looked at it. If my kids were going to go to school and they were going to take courses, this is what I'd want them to do. And so I wrote up an eight-semester curriculum, showed it to him, and <laughs> he said, well, when can you start? I went, uh, we still live in L.A. <laughs> we, you know. So he said, we'll fly you up, give you an apartment. So uh, for eight years, I flew back and forth. Um, and when I came in, I had to kind of work with the curriculum they had. Got rid of, they got rid of all of their instructors except pretty much there were two or three that I really wanted to hang on to. Um, and I had one of my ex-students was teaching there at the time. And uh, so I was able to grab her. Um, Bill Mon at the time, William Mon, uh, kind of was co-director with me, and he moved over to another area eventually. But... Uh, one of the first people that walked in looking for a job was Hui Han. And I looked at his work and I went, you're hired. <laughs> he, I mean, it was great back then. I and mean, we're talking 1990, 91. Um, and so he taught with us for years. And, uh, uh, you know, it was just, it was a small handful of us teaching just a group of courses. And eventually we uh, kind of looked at developing more and more. And we developed, more. We just started with one landscape class because there was no class in it. And eventually that led from to landscape one, landscape two, a class we call studio landscape. 
um, cityscape, urban landscape, a lot of different uh, forms of, of painting outside. And then we'd always have one class where you learn how to take those back inside and learn, do larger studio versions of those. So that's kind of how that transpired over the course of the years. I've been there a long time, and I'm really fortunate they do leave me alone uh, in the school, me meaning my department, not just me personally. Um, and they have a lot of trust and faith in what we've done. And and um, so it's it's been good, but I'm at my age, I'm ready to kind of say, maybe a couple more years. <laughs> That's about it. And people keep saying, no, no, no. I keep saying, yeah, yeah, yeah. So what are you, what are you seeing? Um, how are the students different today than, than they were when maybe when you first started teaching or is there a difference? Are you still seeing the levels yeah. of passion? What, what has changed? I see the passion. I don't see it. I, we get two types of students. Um, and this is, this is, we're talking college. Workshops are completely different, as you as you well know. But we get two types, and I think in workshops you get two types of students also, for that matter. One of them wants the degree, and they like art because art's fun. And they put in work, but they don't put in maximum. Then you get the student who just wants to be really good, and they they just push themselves. They push themselves, and uh, so you get those two. Those two types of students, and it's you can't let go of one, even though you'd really like to work with those other students. But I have misjudged students. Truthfully, I've I've seen students, and I thought, well, they really don't care. They're not that. And all of a sudden, something happens in their towards their senior year, and a switch turns on, and they start turning out beautiful stuff. And I'll t- truthfully, from a from my point of view, um, one of the other instructors' wives said to me, she goes, don't you mind, doesn't it bother you that you're, you're actually creating your competition? And I said, well, I don't necessarily look at it like that, but in some respects, it's good. It's good to feel like I really got to, I mean, I have students sometimes I go, man, I got to pick myself up. I got to kick myself in the butt here because these guys are just, just coming out with some great stuff. Um, so it's, there's an altruistic part to to teaching. Well, right, um, but uh, competition I, I re- like it. competition really yeah. always makes us up our game. You know, no, none of us Absolutely. like it, but it but it makes us better. So it yep. is. Uh, but be, because of um, we're being in this, you know, social media, Instagram selfie kind of a world. Um, you know, lower attention spans, uh, quicker gratification. Mm-hmm. Uh, how does that manifest itself in the art student today? Well, and, and um, it depends upon. Uh, it really depends upon the individual. In general, most of the people that go into fine art, because um, we teach across the board, we teach fine art. We have illustration students come over, visual development. They all love fine art. You get it. If I have a class of twenty, for example, I may have two students that you can tell just want to waiting for a coffee break to come. You know, the rest of them are just engaged and passionate um however they do there are they are on their cell phones a lot and i I, in a a model class i've seen them i don't know i've caught them doing this where they'll take a photo of the model on there and instead of models right in front of them but instead of looking at the model they're looking at their cell image on the cell phone and I, i go over and say why are you even what are you doing that's the model this is an image of the model. Paint the model. You can see more. So we do get that, that kind of individual who feels compelled to always have that as a backup. And uh, it's, it's unfortunate. It's not a lot of them, but there is that, that side to it. So uh, what happens to these students? You, you've, you've had 30 years of students graduating and going out into the world. How many of them really make it? You know, are, are, are they succeeding? You know, uh, they find this, and I tell people this all the time, you find your avenue. You find your, uh, some of them become gallery artists. I know two or three that have actually opened galleries. Some, I have some that have become, um, what do you call it? Oh. Uh, 
in conservation, at museum conservation. Right, right. And uh, so we've had a few move into that area. Uh, some go into teaching, some go into elementary school teaching, um, usually art, almost always art, as a matter of fact. Um, most of them stay engaged in one way or another in art. Uh, that That is something that I have found. The, the ones that excel are not necessarily always – I do know great ones – that I don't know what has happened to him. I was a young lady who graduated about nine years ago, a couple of them. Phenomenal. I mean, incredible painters. I don't know what's going on with either one of them to this day. And I've known other people that have gone through and done pretty well, and they they keep growing, and they keep getting better. And you just, you know, you're, and I see their work now, and it's kind of, wow. You know, it's just, it's phenomenal to see. So... Um, but I would say the majority of them have stayed involved in art in one way or another. Uh-huh. They may not be full-time what we consider painters, which is fine. I think people have to find their own comfort zone, what feels, what fits fits their personality. You have to have the right personality to be, as you well know, Eric, you have to have the right kind of personality to be um, a painter. You have to little, have a little bit of an entrepreneurial side to yourself, so... Well, we both know painters who are very successful who don't have entrepreneurial sides, oh. though. I mean, you, you know, the the key for those people, though, is figuring out who they can hand it off to or how they can get some help. Now, what about training? Um, it, you know, you and I were talking offline before this started about the idea that um, I have this goal of figuring out how to get art marketing as a pretty substantial curriculum piece into all of the art schools because I think it's so critical and yet it seems to be something that is considered poisonous or venomous or evil or, you know, marketing. How dare you compromise by marketing? What are your thoughts on that? Oh, it's, I, I'm 100% behind you. I, when I first came to the academy, I told you it was, I remember uh, there was a rebellion with a, a lot of the students, and they, uh, they wanted to have a meeting with me. And so uh, we sat up in one of the uh, big, smaller auditoriums and had a meeting, and they said, well, what if we don't want to compromise and sell our art? I said, that's your choice. You know, that's fine. But if you are, are if you are to continue doing this, you have to purchase supplies. You have to have a place to live, a place to work, a place to eat. I said, I know a young lady that I was – a restaurant that I had been going to for years, and she was a bartender. And uh, I don't know how we got into it. Uh, my wife and I were in there, and we started talking. And lo and behold, she was not a bartender. She was a painter. She's an artist. But she's a bartender. She's an artist. But she wasn't making her living. So uh, a person can be a very passionate, um, I don't know, uh, hobbyist. I don't mean that as, as a put down. They can be very passionate about it, meaning and where they don't want it. They just want to. I do know we had a, a man take courses of ours who was very successful, two of them. Uh, one had been the original attorney for uh, Apple when they started. So he left with a boatload of money, and he just wanted to learn how to paint. He didn't ever care if he sold. He wanted to be able to travel the world and paint, and which is fine. How many of those are there? There's very few of those. Most of us are like me, where you don't have – I had no financial backing when I graduated. I had nothing. I had to go out and make it. Most of us are like that, and you can be a great artist and starve, or you can be even not even a great artist, just a pretty good artist, mediocre, and do exceptionally well. The difference is marketing. Now, I I tell you an interesting story. It's an individual that you know. uh, He's no longer with us, Thomas Kincaid. Um, Tom actually had been a student of mine at Art Center. He was in class. He and James Gurney uh, were in class. And Tom went out and did, you know, he was a decent student. He painted really good still lifes. I remember that. And he went out and became this, you know, mega wealthy artist through marketing. He found a niche, got into it, and marketed the hell out of it. Well, when I first started the academy, another instructor and myself walked down to Market Street, and he had his own gallery there, one of his, the, his galleries. And we walked in and looked around, and the guy showed us 
and talk to how he, he said, well, here's here's his new edition that's going to be coming out. I said, well, we're not, we're, our, he said, well, let me show you what he's doing. And he, he had a plan where he would come out with a series and they would call, you know, Lamplighter Lane, Lamplighter Walkway, Lamplighter Cottage, all these. And he would hook people into that first one and then they'd want the second, the third, and the fourth. And I remember walking out and the instructor said to me, that work gives me a stomach ache. And I said to him, I says, good work can be marketed too. And that that's where I left it. Well, that led us to developing a, a course. It's We only have one. We need more of this stuff. We have a course we call uh, Senior Portfolio Professional Practices. And in that, we try, we make the students at a senior level, junior, senior level, go out and make two gallery contacts, enter at least two shows, put together a website, um, come up with what they consider a five-year market, four or four, five-year marketing plan. And um, it's worked pretty well. A lot of the students don't want to take it. They'll come in, and it's one of those classes that we won't waive it. You have to take it. But really, you know, I'm not an expert marketer. I know a little bit about it because I marketed myself as a as a commercial artist, as an illustrator. Um, and they need so much more. Uh, I, uh, two friends that are exceptionally uh, talented artists right now that are both doing very, very well, paint in totally different directions. They both tell me, um, one of them was a teacher, and he quit, oh, maybe 10 years ago. And he said, I said, oh, it's Gil Dillinger, by the way, it was a guy, and I said to Gil, I said, how are you doing? He said, I am doing better than I've ever done financially. I said, really, Gil, that's great. He says, you know what it is? Marketing. I spend time marketing, which I was never able to do when I was teaching. I went, I got I, those words run true to me because that's kind of a situation say that I'm in kind of in the same way where I don't have the opportunity to market. And the other friend of mine lives in Seattle, James Dietz. Uh, and he basically paints, uh, nostalgia, uh, military scenes from world war two. And, and he's got collectors all over and he's at several museums and Jim spends, he says, he takes every Friday is his business day. He's that organized. He does if he needs supplies, if he needs to contact people, if he needs to write letters, if he needs to to deal with website, if he needs to do with anything, he does that on Friday. So, in in both cases, in both of these guys, besides being super talented artists, they've done exceptionally well because they've marketed themselves. So I use that as a as a catalyst when I have a chance to talk to students. Well, I think it's critical and thank you for doing that. And, and, um, you know, I, I teach take one day a week and, and focus on your marketing and nobody wants to do it, but when they do it, they see just that one day a week, they can see a substantial increase. So I, I've got a lot of stuff I want to cover in a fairly short amount of time. So, um, I'd like to talk about plein air painting uh, specifically yeah. because you do it so beautifully, uh, and I know you do workshops, what are the things that you really think are the essentials that people need to be focusing on uh, when they're learning to paint or, or, quite frankly, when they're trying to get to the next level? Because we've got people who are in both categories here. You've, you've, got, yeah. you know, you've got people all over the world listening to this who are they're beginners. They've never plein air painted before. You got some that are somewhere in between. You've got all the way up to pros, and yet everybody can learn something. What are the things that you really want to leave us with today that are really critical uh, skills, and how do we get there on those skills? Okay, I, I, I've broken this down several times, and when I've talked about it, to five different basic things. And the first is drawing, and um, if you're if you're not going to do figure work, then don't worry about that. I mean, it's great to practice it because it trains your eye. But drawing and drawing, I break it down into three basic areas. Number one, perspective. You know, so we're dealing with perspective, both linear. We can talk about atmospheric in a second. Um, the second is proportion. Proportion, how one length, how one size relates to another. And the third, if you're dealing with, this only deals with figure, is gesture. 
and that's the gesture, the movement, the angles. The second thing, that's first. You have to kind of get that down. The second is value, which I, if somebody said what's the most important, value. That's my personal opinion, and I've heard this from other people too. It's, it is. I always, there's a great line. I don't even know where I heard it. Value does the work. Color gets the credit. That's a great line. I love it. Because value is what, is how we make things, how we re- see things. Think of black and white photographs, for example, before we had color. Black and white. We saw things in value. So value becomes the next most important thing. The third is color. Color, you think, you think of color as seasoning or something, where color gives something, the intensity of the color, uh, the, the decision of the palette, whether it's a limited palette, whether it's an analogous palette, whether someone's going to be a tonal palette, or whether it's someone's going to, you know, do a full-blown uh, palette using, you know, relatively uh, the spectrum of colors. Um, the composition. Composition in, in plain air, to me, is one of the most important things. I'll tell you a mistake I, I made when I was originally starting plain air painting. I picked my subjects, or what I was going to paint, because I loved a subject. I loved the texture in that tree. I loved the paint peeling off the side of that building. Um, I loved the rusty wheelbarrow. Um, well, that's fine, but I've kind of grown from that and realize that I look at design, spatial breakup, and the way that I do that when I'm on location is by closing one eye so I lose the stereoscopic vision, and then I squint with the other eye, and I lose detail, and you begin to see shapes and designs, spatial breakup, value relationships, light and dark. So that becomes very important. The last one that everyone's going to struggle with forever, myself included, is your technical approach, your technique. And your technique has a lot to do with what I like to refer to as intent. You have to begin your piece with an intention. You have to, am I going to do a painterly piece? Am I, is this piece going to be more refined? Is this piece going to have thick paint in it? Am I going to use thin to thick? And so that's something that we all work on forever. Um, you can get past the first two or three stages, but that the technical side is something that we that we work on. And then to, to throw a little additional thing in there, uh, your choice, what it is you're going to paint. Um, if you're starting, don't pick something tremendously complicated. Start simple. In fact, I tell people to start when there's learning plain air to start practicing still lifes at home. It's, you know, you're painting from life. The light doesn't move. Um, you, so you, if you do that, but if you go out, that the technical side, your technique, your style, like some people like to call it, um, that happens over a period of time. Um, as you become more familiar with the way the paint goes down as to, to certain um, characteristics that it has when you put wet paint into wet paint, when you put uh, how, how you lay a light over a dark, all these things are technical things that people need to learn. And some of that is is paint consistency. Some of it is brush pressure. Some of it is the choice of the brush you use. Um, some of it might even be the surface you're painting on. So there's so many factors. It's, this is the great thing about art and painting, I think, is you'll never learn it all. <laughs> just, just I had a teacher that used to say, I love their, a teacher of mine used to say, your mind will stay five years ahead of your ability. And I love that line because if you think about it, you're striving to get to this one level and you finally reach it. But at that point, you've already started looking at other levels beyond where you're at, and you're shooting for those levels. And I think um, all great artists, great painters do that constantly. So how do you, but how do you have breakthroughs? Because I remember one time I was on a trip with Scott Christensen. We went to Russia together. 
and uh, we looked at the great Russian masters in the Russian Museum, and, and he came over to me. He almost had tears in his eyes. He said, Eric, I, don't, I thought I had accomplished something, and I don't yeah. know that I can ever get to a level anywhere close to this. This is so humbling. And then he called me when he got home. He said, I can't paint anymore. I, this, is, this is just, it's, it's ruined me. And I said, Scott, just stick with it. You'll break through it. And then he called me about, I don't know, six months or a year later. He says, I finally had a breakthrough. He said, but, but is, is there something that you can tell us that helps us have those breakthroughs? Or is it just having that moment where you have that sinking feeling in your heart, like, I don't know if I can ever pull this off? You know, I, it's hard to say. Uh, uh, Giacomo Favoretto has done that with me. I look at it and I go, man, am I? And Ender Zorn, I look at my work and I go, I am so unambitious. These guys did things that were just, just blew me away. And so I understand what Scott was referring to in that regard. Um, I don't go through that like he did. Great work, that work is way beyond mine, inspires the crap out of me. It just makes me want to work. And uh, that may just have to do with different people and different personalities, but it does the opposite. It goes... I want to do that. I want to. I want to be that. And the only way I know how to do it is to keep going after it. Um, perseverance is, uh, you know, persistence and perseverance are the two most uh, important factors in the growth of any artist. I think if you don't have that, if you don't have that perseverance and persistence, you're not going to grow. And we're all going to go through hills and valleys, as I like to call them, hills meaning the peaks where we really, we hit that, and then the valleys where we kind of feel like, you know, we're still producing work, but it just isn't hitting those peaks we want. Um, I I don't know anybody that doesn't go through that. Uh, Everybody I know goes through that. Every now and then, students ask me, well, tell me about when you do a really good painting. I said, you know what, here's my this may be true or not true, but it's what I've come up with. Maybe once every three years, I do a painting that to me is a breakthrough. Maybe once three, once every five. Maybe I do three paintings a year that I think are really, really strong. The rest of them are fine. And with the fine ones are a few stinkers that I try and hide and never show. But uh, what happens is our bad paintings aren't as bad. They get better. And we, we don't, what we think of them as bad because we've already gone, it's like what, what my teacher said, mine stays five years ahead of your ability. It's what, it's what you just described that Scott went through. He looked at that and he went, oh my God. But persevere, persist, and God knows if we're ever going to reach that, that level that, that our heroes hit. You know, that we also have to think about that we have a lot more distractions nowadays than many of them did. Um, however, I look at Rembrandt and I say, this guy did not have incandescent light bulbs. <laughs> he had work in certain, in a certain period of time. And in Holland, it gets in the winter, it gets dark pretty early. So, you know, I, I look at all their, but they didn't have some of the, um, they didn't movie theaters right now. We don't have those either, but they didn't have movie theaters. They didn't have automobiles so they could just take off and do things. So it was really different if you start to look back at some of these guys and they had more it's like the guys it's like i I went to egypt once and they they said the way they built the pyramids these people had time yet you know six thousand people crossed the nile and they've got time on their hands so uh our time nowadays in today's society is pretty limited we're we're torn with this we're torn and if you have a family you know we gotta i gotta take my kids to basketball i coached basketball i you know, and then, and then you want to kind of stay healthy. I heard you earlier talking about riding a bike, um, and I try and run, uh, and it's the same thing. So you, we're working with all these different levels, and you know, when I get in my studio or when I get outside and paint, either one, I'm in my own realm. I'm in my own thing, and you know, sometimes I just want to do. Uh, I paint a lot, by the way, Eric. I paint a. Uh, whole lot and if i even when i come home if i teach all day sometimes i'll come home from the studio and go into my studio for two hours and say i'm going to do a little two-hour study here and i do it and then i'll come down and have dinner and feel fine 
it's like it, it's who you are. Somebody, I think a painter is, is it's just ingrained in you. It's just who you are. It's like we do these workshops in Europe now, and uh, it's you know the, the people that come with us just love it because we get up, we're experiencing the, the the country, we're experiencing the culture, and at the same time we're we're painting and people are coming up and talking to us and asking us questions and it's just it's exhilarating. It's just wonderful. Well, I was saying, I was reading a book yesterday. It's it's uh, the studies of Frederick Church it came out of the National Gallery, and um, and and there are these paintings of icebergs, and I mm. I love painting icebergs. I've been up to Newfoundland painting icebergs. I'm going to take a group up there one day. But I I thought about you know what did Frederick Church have to go through. You know, he first off he had to take a horse and buggy, probably maybe yep. a train down to New York City, and then he had to catch a ship going up, and you know that ship was probably several days, and then they had to hike inland. And you know, what you think about the the paintings that these people did, uh, you know, the the vistas, uh, the Hudson River School paintings, and they, I read uh, Durand wrote a story about he had taken a, a cart and buggy all the way up as far as he could on this dirt road, and then he and one of his helpers basically lugged up a studio easel and he ground his paints on location to, and he, he, oh, and he camped up there for, for five days to do this big painting. Uh, so it was more than just a study. I mean, he was doing a studio work outdoors and, and right. it, it makes me feel like a wimp. You know, this morning I, the sun came up, I thought, I think I'll get up and do a painting. Uh, no, I'm going to sleep in a little bit. <laughs> I know, I know the feeling. <laughs> I know the feeling exactly. It's a, and that's one of the nice things about being with other artists at times, because there's times that I want to be alone and paint, and there's times it's great to be with uh, other artists and uh, and kind of feed off their inspiration, and they feed off of yours. So it, it works great. Yeah, and that's when some, really somebody goes where I live up here, that that Han, Hui Han, a great friend of mine, move about a mile away, so we get to see each other pretty often. Well, and, and, you know, what's nice about workshops like what you're doing in Europe is that, you know, a lot of people won't do uh, in their normal life, what they, even if they have the time, which they usually don't. They go to a workshop like yours, they're out there doing it twice, three times a day, you know, they're, they're painting sunrise, mm-hmm. they're painting sunset. And so that uh, really helps people do things that they otherwise wouldn't do. So, yeah, absolutely. So, uh, what, by the way, just so you know, uh, you inspired me to, uh, to t- do a workshop in Holland because I saw a lot of posts that you did from Holland, and I had been there several times. And I hadn't really thought about it, and I went, I got to do And we did a workshop over there about three years ago, and everybody, they said, well, I wasn't sure about Holland, but I went along with you. I am so glad. It was so great. So, well, you know, it's just wonderful. Painting windmills isn't actually easy, is it? No. <laughs> Not at all. Well, got, that's where that drawing part comes in. Really important there. Yeah, yeah, it really does, and and so spectacular. And and of course the light there and the and the clouds and the grays. It's just re- really magnificent. Well, yeah, absolutely. Almost every place we've been um, it has been like that. And then even here, right here, I find inspiration in the vineyards right around me. So. Oh yeah, well you live in a great area to paint, and you've got great people to paint with. So uh, yeah. one thing I'm curious about, I was going to ask you earlier, is I hear a lot of people, people will walk up to me when I'm outdoors painting, and they, and, and you've had this a thousand times, you know, they'll say, oh, you know, my Aunt Mabel paints, or my aunt, my grandfather was a painter, and I oh. wish I could do it, but I don't have any talent, I can't draw a stick figure. What, um, do, do you believe that there is such a thing as natural inborn talent. Is it something that you believe anybody can learn? Where are you on that spectrum? I'm on this, the latter part of that. I think it, there. I, I think there is inborn something. And I mean, it depends on what you mean as talent. Um, I think there's inborn interest. Um, interest develops talent. Is my feeling. Uh, you know, I got a feeling if you took two kindergartners and you give them a pencil, and you put something in front of them, I think, I don't know how much of a difference there would be in the quality of the drawing of whatever they did. I don't really don't think it's that. I think with, I I remember myself, and I was in second grade, and uh, 
I got enamored with Disney characters, and I learned that I could draw Dumbo, and I liked it. It was fun, and other people liked it. They looked at it, and they liked it. And I think that was the beginning of what some people would refer to as talent. I, I think anybody can learn to paint pretty well. Um, I, it's like I tell students, I, say, I can teach you to paint good. I can't teach you to paint great. I can't, because that's inside you. Right. I can teach you to paint well. And I think um, there are a lot of people that in, just enjoy it, and they're not necessarily looking to be um, the world's greatest artist. Uh, I think what, what they do is they just love the process, and they want their paintings to look good. Um, but I think, I think people can be taught. I really believe that. I believe it with, with everything in my soul, really. I think, uh, like I say, I, I don't know that we can teach them to be really, really good painters, but we can teach them to paint uh, a relatively simple landscape or relati relatively simple still life pretty well. Um, where they take that is, a lot of it is, that persistence and perseverance, that's where I think the talent comes. I mean, I don't know, because uh, you hear stories about young people sitting down at the piano for the first time and being able to play. Uh, I don't know anybody that's done that. I've heard stories about it. Um, but I, I know there can be a lineage if you look at the Wyeths, you know, Andrew Wyeth or N.C. Wyeth, Andrew Wyeth, Jamie Wyeth. You look at the Wyeths and there's a, a lineage, so there may be something in that. Well, it's, but, osmos it's osmosis. I mean, you know, I, th I think about... Uh, exactly. Right, so Jamie grew up around his grandfather and his father, and it, it was, you know, they were always painting. My kids are growing up around me, and, you know, they don't have any interest in it right now, but they, they're being, exp you know, we've got all these artists who come over to the house. I'm always painting. I've always got a model, you know, and, and that will rub off on them in some way. Just like when I grew up, my dad was doing business meetings on the phone and I was sitting there listening in, not, you know, not on the, not, not hearing both sides of the conversation, but some of those things came more naturally because I was comfortable with them because that's what I was around the whole time. And I think that's, that's the what I would refer to as osmosis. Yeah, I, my mom was a dance teacher and a dancer. Uh, my dad, basically, both my parents were pretty good. My mother could do watercolor. She didn't do them too often. She just did them for fun. Uh, on my father's side, his mother, my grandmother, was a costume designer for the Ice Follies and things like that. So I saw a lot of that uh, growing up. Now, my kids... None of them went into, uh, well, I shouldn't say that. Ian, our youngest, is a filmmaker. He uh, he does uh, documentary um, stuff. He's just 30, and, uh, you know, he's had been in a few film festivals and won an award. And he's making it, not making it big, but making it. Um, our daughter, all, every one of our kids was good in art, everyone. None of them really pursued it, and it's because my wife paints and I paint, and, between that, uh, I think I think they saw how hard I worked. I think they saw that I was working day and night because I was uh, illustrating when they were first born. And uh, that had a lot to do with it. But I remember being, the first workshop I ever did in, I did it in Cortona, Italy, and all, our kids came. And my daughter said, can I try? She was a teenager at the time. And I said, sure, I had an uh, extra little paint box with me. And I set it up. She sat next to another artist. She finished it, and she came over to me, and she says, this is really hard. <laughs> and I just started laughing. I just started laughing. I thought it was funny. She's really never done anything since, but I just thought it was interesting that uh, I kind of, inside, I went, yes. I had the opposite. <laughs> they realize it's hard. It's not something you just sit down and you do really well the first time. I had the opposite story. I bought my daughter a little make-your-own ukulele kit for Christmas one year, and this year she decided to put a painting on it, and uh, so she asked if she could borrow some of my acrylic paints, and so she did. And she brings this thing out, and it is absolutely beautiful, perfect. I mean, it's a, <laughs> it's a plein air painting that... I would have put on my wall any time. It was just that good. I mean, she had oh, edges, geez. she had values, she had everything down. And she's only, I think she took one art lesson in her life because I took her up to Studio Incominati with me one day. But 
I mean, she blew me away. But I think it's because she's, just, you know, she'll sit out in the studio and watch me sometimes. Uh, and uh, she doesn't want to paint, but she's taking it in. So it's interesting yeah. how our, our kids take it. And, you know, I, I also think, you know, your kids one day when they turn 40 or 50 or 60 or whatever, one day they may go, you know what, I'm going back to this. This is something that, you know, I have, uh, I have um, a feel for because I grew up with it. Yeah, our youngest son uh, during this this uh, kind of staying in quarantine, whatever you call it, uh, called me up. He lives about a mile from us. And he said, "Do you have any pastels I can?" I said, "Yeah, I've got two or three boxes. I'll give you one." And so I thought I was really impressed. He came over, got a set of pastels, went home, and started doing some landscapes. Nice, nice. <laughs> so you know, in between editing film stuff. Oh, that's cool. So who knows? You're you're absolutely right. This is one of these great professions. It's there was a cartoon that I saw a friend of mine sent me, or I think it may have saw it on the internet. I don't know. And it was four cartoons of an artist painting on a board, kind of leaning over. And the first one was pre-pandemic, and the, and then it said uh, I, maybe it was yeah it was four. I forget what the four during pandemic. After pandemic, it was the same pose. Right. <laughs> In other words, we're, we're all we're, we're doing what we do. Right. So it's really been fortunate to a degree for for many of us artists. Um, it's it hasn't curtailed us other than the social side of it that it has, but uh, we can still work. Well, it's just made us concentrate harder, and we we have literally exposed art to to. Uh, hundreds of thousands of people during this pandemic because, you know, a lot of people are discovering these free samples we've been putting online. And, and, Absolutely. and, and great. I, I've had stories from people who have said, you know, I, I did it 30 years ago and I gave it up and you inspired me to come back. I've had people say, I've never done it. And, and I watched, I realized I could do it, you know, so uh, to me, that's a good day. If, if somebody picks it up, that's a good day. Well, Craig, this has been absolutely fascinating. You're, you're, I, I think we could go on for hours and hours, and unfortunately we don't have those hours. Do you have any final yeah. thoughts that you want to leave with people uh, about plein air painting or, or just thoughts in general? Um, the only thing I could think of is, is do it. Just go out and do it. And, you know, grab some videos if, if you're not sure about process. Uh, there's so many great videos out there. Um, you know, if you can link up with another artist, I know I've been doing these Friday free demos online every Friday for an hour and a half. Um, and I've had people do the same thing. I've had ex students contact me and, uh, things of that nature. My feeling really is just do it. Uh, I don't know. It's like one of my teachers said, you get better, you learn how to paint and learn how to get better by painting. Do it. It's fun. Don't get upset. The, you know, use that line for every artist needs to make frustration your friend. Use that line and enjoy I, a line that I use. Enjoy the process because you won't always enjoy the results. <laughs> That's so true. And the process yeah. is so wonderful. So have fun. I mean, we, we all got into this because it was fun. We didn't get into it. Uh, that's why I got into it. Yeah. And then I f tried to figure out how to make a living out of it. But I got into it because it's just fun. Yeah, absolutely. Well, it still is. Well, Craig, thank you so much for being on the Plein Air Podcast today. You're more than welcome. Thank you, Eric. And thanks thanks for all the uh, marketing advice you've given to everybody. It's um, It's been inspirational for myself, too. Well, thanks again to Craig Nelson. I think he's very impressive, don't you? I think he's a great painter, a great instructor, and he's a walking library of wisdom about art. I mean, imagine painting and teaching for as long as he has. Well, are you guys ready for some marketing ideas? This is the Marketing Minute with Eric Rhodes, author of the number one Amazon bestseller, Make More Money Selling Your Art, proven techniques to turn your passion into profit. All righty. Well, in the Marketing Minute, I try to answer your questions. There are no stupid questions. Uh, just stupid answers, and those would be coming from me. Anyway, uh, just tell me your name and your town and submit it by email, eric at artmarketing.com. All right, here's a quest question from Katrina Gorman from San Antonio, Texas, who says or asks, what advice can you give to help uh, follow-up conversations with a collector, a potential buyer? If somebody's interested in your work and they say they need to think about it, 
when should you follow up with them? And how many times are too many to follow up without feeling like you're bugging them if you can't reach them? Well, Katrina, you're not going to love what I have to say here. I'm sorry. I'm, you kind of hit a nerve. I know that you're, um, this is going to hurt. But when, some, when, when you're approached by somebody, let's say you're in a store and somebody approaches you and says, can I help you? What do you say? Just looking. So uh, what do you say when you want to not buy something? You say, I need to think about it. That is a stock term. We all use it. I need to think about it. You don't want to lie to somebody. You don't want to hurt their feelings. So you say, I need to think about it. Well, those words are the kiss of death. When you hear those words, you are almost dead in the water. I say almost because I'm going to teach you some moves. But anyway, if they need to think about it, they're probably not interested. Now, they might be, but maybe they don't want to be pressured. Maybe they do want to think about it. But usually, it's a way to escape. Now, I'm going to show you a couple of things that are effective. It's going to take some courage. You ready for this, Katrina? Well, first off, um, you say this. Uh, I'm going to give you a little role play here. So, it's you. You say, Uh, are you interested in this piece of art? And they say, well, I don't know. I need to think about it. And then you say, well, tell me about it. uh, Tell me about it. Uh, What what are you thinking? And then they'll say something, right? So the idea is just say, when they say, I need to think about it, you say, well, no, tell me about it. And, And that's a tool you can use. And by the way, you keep somebody talking for an hour by that. You can say, you know, tell me about it. Tell me more. So they say, you know, let's say, I need to think about it. You say, tell me about it. Well, I'm not exactly sure, you know, where I would hang it. And you can say, hang it? Tell me more. And they go, well, you know, I was kind of thinking about, should I hang it in the living room or the bedroom? And you go, well, what do you think? Well, I don't know. I kind of think it'd be best in the bedroom. Okay, why do you think that? Well, because I'd like to wake up in the morning every morning and look at that because it's such a beautiful painting and such a beautiful view. And then you can say, beautiful view? Oh, yeah, I love the view, and I would really love to have that. What happens when you do that is that you don't have to pressure anybody, but what you do is you keep them talking, and then you find that you're able to kind of lead them along so that they take themselves. Next thing you know, this is like, you know what? I think that is a beautiful view. I think I would like to look at it in my bedroom every morning, and I think I will buy it. That's one thing. Now, um, you can also... Uh, ask them for feedback. You know, tell me more, tell me more about that. And you're peeling back the onion and eventually most people will give you the real truth. And usually the real truth is, I don't like it or I don't love it or the price is too high or something like that. Now, you can, you can say this one. This one takes a little bit more courage. Uh, they say, I want to think about it. You can say, you know, forgive me for saying this, but when most people tell me they want to think about it, What they really mean is that they're not interested, but they don't really want to hurt my feelings. If that's the case, I'm okay with it. Believe me, I don't believe in pressure. But the problem is, if you tell me you want to think about it and you're not really interested, I'm probably going to be following up with you. I'm going to call you and you're going to be hiding out, not taking my calls. And I'm just going to keep calling and you're going to keep finding messages from me. And, you know, I don't want to really waste your time and I know you don't want to waste mine. So, if, if you're really not interested in it, just go ahead and tell me that. You're not going to hurt my feelings. And so which is it? Are you simply not interested or do you really truly need to think about it? Well, if they say, no, I'm simply not interested, that's cool. You say, well, thank you for your honesty. I really appreciate that. And I hope we can do business sometime in the future and then let it go. But if they say, no, no, I truly do need to think about it, then you can say, well, what exactly do you need to think about Maybe I can help you answer some questions, or you can use those moves I told you about before. And then don't say anything. Just just be quiet and listen. Now, another thing you can do when they say they need some time to think about it, you can say, that's terrific. How much time do you need, and when should I follow up with you? Because I don't want to be a pest. And then they'll tell you, well, you know, you can text me, and text me by Thursday, I'll have an answer. Now, whenever somebody escapes, you're not going to sell them. Most people who leave don't ever come back and buy but then you can try to do some things to keep them coming back or thinking, thinking about them. But you could say um, something like, uh, to try to get them in, you say, um, 
you know, what, what could we do today? What, if, what could we do to make this happen today? Because I know, quite frankly, you know, if you walk out the door, the chance of you ever owning my painting, I'd really love to see you own it. You know, you love it. You think it's cool. So what could we do to make this happen today? And then sometimes they'll say, well, I don't know. You know, maybe if you, you know, knock a few bucks off the price or you do something, you know, maybe they could do that. Or you could, you could you know, try something. And, and if you get a sale, it's better than not getting a sale. Now, regarding your question about how many times do you follow up, most people give up too soon. I have, um, ha- if I have something important pending, I'll usually never stop. I will try lots of interesting ways to get their attention. I'll call them, I'll text them, I'll email them, I'll FedEx them, I'll send them something in the mail, send notes or whatever. And usually, if somebody really doesn't want to be dogged, uh, then they're going to eventually step up and say, listen, I'm really not interested. I just said I was uh, thinking about it, and they'll tell you the truth finally. So that's why you don't you know, really want to go through that. But sometimes I have breakthroughs. I follow up with somebody, and they come through, and I end up selling them something. And, and I won't chase something unless it's really a big sale. I won't chase something for small amounts of money because it's not worth the time. It might be worth the time in your case because a small amount of money might be a big amount of money to you. But um, the other thing is never let somebody leave without giving you something in return. So you can, here's here's a move you can make, for instance, say, you know, I, I know you love that painting and I know you're probably not likely to buy it. And that's okay, by the way, to say something like that because that might push them the opposite direction. There's a whole theory about that. Uh, Maybe I'll talk about that someday. Anyway, you say, listen, can I take a picture of this painting and text it to you? And they say, sure. You know, and you can say, well, I'll tell you what, let me take your picture in front of it. And so you take their picture in front of it. Then you say, okay, give me your text number and you text it to them. Now you have their text. Now they have a reminder and you can, in the text, you can say, by the way, you know, here's, this is the name of the painting and this is the price, et cetera. Now there's another tool. uh, This is oftentimes misused and I don't want to see you misuse it, but this tool is called urgency. I never suggest lying or even insinuating something, but if you truly have somebody else who's interested, you can tell them that. Now they might not believe you. They might believe this is false um, urgency. But, you know, you might, uh, you might be able to say that, for instance, hey, you know, I know you're interested in this. I know this sounds like a game, but there was a guy in here earlier today, and he was kind of interested. He said he might come back, quite frankly. I don't know if he will. Uh, but, you know, all of a sudden, this kind of creates a little different chemical reaction. They're like, oh, maybe I ought to do something about this if I'm truly serious about it. Some people, that has a negative effect. Uh, the other thing is, if you sense that somebody's going to be interested in something, say that before you get to that point. So, you know, somebody says, hey, I like this painting. I said, and you could say, well, you know, it seems to be the thing going on today. There was a guy in here earlier. I don't know if he's going to come back and get it or not, but he, he likes it too. So you're just kind of planting that seed. And then all of a sudden it's like, you know, it's like when you walk into a car dealer and you like the purple car and they say, well, we only got one purple and we can't get any more purple for uh, six more months. And by the way, there's somebody in here looking at this today. All of a sudden you're like, hmm, maybe I need to get my purple car. I don't have a purple car, I'm just saying, you know? Okay, so anyway, that's uh, one of the moves you can make. Now, here's the next question, and that's from Paige in St. Louis. Paige, who says, I'm an artist. I know nothing about marketing. Where do I start? Where do I learn? What do I do? Paige, I love St. Louis. I love the old train station that's now a hotel. I can't think of the name of it. And of course, there's a great blues club downtown near the Arch. Anyway, I love St. Louis. Uh, you should know, Paige, that you're not alone. Most artists have no idea where to start, and most don't even want to do marketing. But before I tell you where to start, I want to reiterate that marketing is the difference between having gas in a car or not having any gas. The more gas you have, the longer you can go. And you don't like to go to the gas station. I don't either. I hate pumping gas. I hate the inconvenience. I'd rather not have to stop. But It's a fact of life. I know I have to stop at the gas station and put gas in the car. And if I don't, I'm going to run out of gas and then I got a problem. So uh, just like that, you've got to adopt a must do attitude about marketing. In other words, I'm going to put gas in my car every week and I'm going to start learning it and learning how to do it. And I'm going to adjust to it. So remember that marketing is not a single event or a one-time thing. It's something that you will have to adopt for the rest of your life. As long as you're trying to sell artwork or whatever you're trying to sell, it's a fact of life as an artist. So those of us who choose to develop muscles in marketing will thrive, and those who don't typically will not. 
the idea of the, if you build it, they will come. It's just not true. You know, just because you're a great painter or a great sculptor or a great whatever, just know that uh, you're not necessarily going to get discovered. I mean, sometimes people do, but it's rare. So where to begin? Well, first off, there's a ton of information in the market. Lots of people, including me, offering books, courses, videos, etc. They're probably all pretty good. Uh, most people who teach this stuff are probably pretty good. My stuff is based on real life and building businesses. There's no theory in what I do. So mine is as tested. I can't tell you about the others. But this is a little self-serving, but for 25 bucks, you can get my book. It's called Make More Money Selling Your Art. And it's a good foundation for, you know, for learning marketing. It's a good start. Most people wrongly start with what I call tactics, things like ads, Things like flyers, you know, uh, social media, stuff like, et cetera. But to be effective, you can't start with tactics. You have to start with strategy. In order to get strategy, you got to define your goals. And to get your goals, you got to think about your dreams. From that, your strategy comes. And then, you know, you, once you have your strategy, you got to ask yourself, you know, who am I going after? Who's my target? What's their age group? How do I talk to them? What do they need to hear? What's important to them? What buttons do they need pushed? From that, then you can focus on the tactics. And the tactics might be, do I buy this ad? Do I do this flyer? Do I do a postcard? Do I do a website? You know, all of those kinds of things. It's all very overwhelming. You know, my best advice is to take Fridays or one day a week, any day a week. Mondays would probably be a good day too. But take one day a week and say, you know what? For the full day, every week, no matter what, I'm going to work on my marketing. One day out of five, 20%, right? Don't count the weekends. Work on your marketing might be reading, it might be watching a video, it might be working on your website, it might be taking a course, it might be working on social media. But if you devote one day to marketing and you don't avoid it ever, you will start to develop muscles and it's like going to the gym, you know, you don't, you don't get any action early, but before you know it, you got these big old honking muscles under your arms. Maybe you don't. Um, anyway, uh, you may not love it, but uh, I don't love going to the gym, but I do it because it's good for me, right? And that's what you got to think about. So Friday marketing is a really great idea. Second thing is <clears throat> dream your dreams, dream big dreams, determine your goals, but each goal has to have clarity and exactness. For instance, if you can't just say, I want to get rich. Uh, and, and by the way, it's not always about money, right? But you can't just say, I want to get rich. You might say, well, I want to make $100,000. To me, that's rich. Or you might say $10,000. You might say whatever your number is, you've got to have something that's measurable so you can see how you're doing. You know, So you break it into steps. You reverse it. So let's say you want to make $100,000. So you say, how much is that a month? How much is that a week? How many paintings do I have to sell to make that? How many paintings do I have to make to be able to sell that many? How do I market that? How much do I have to spend on marketing? Every dollar that you spend on marketing is more likely to make you money than to cost you money. But most people think of it as a cost. I think it, of it as a necessity. And I spend a huge amount of money in marketing every year, and it just pays off. Now, sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes I mess it up. Sometimes it doesn't work. You know, there, you're going to have to learn and experiment. Uh, but do one thing, pick one thing, you know, read my book, pick one thing, and don't try to do 10 things, just pick one project and work on that and work on it towards hitting your goals. Do it, just keep learning from it, make adjustments. Uh, everything you do is going to help. It might be slower, but don't be in a hurry. Just take your time. Don't spend a lot of money in the beginning. Just ultimately take some time and learn and do something. It's better to do something than to get locked up about, you know, there are 10 things I could do, which should I do? You can't do all 10 things right away. You have to develop your muscles. And so do one thing and just do one thing really, really well. Ultimately, we learn by doing. Read a lot. If it's painful, go to seminars or events. I teach art marketing at my conferences, plein air convention, figurative art convention, and so on. So, and sometimes I, I consult people or do marketing talks or podcast recordings at my events. So, uh, you know, pick something and learn it and do it well. Anyway, I hope this has been helpful for you. This has been the Marketing Minute with Eric Rhodes. You can learn more at artmarketing.com. Okay, well, a reminder to sign up for the world's first global plein air experience. It's called Plein Air Live. It's virtual, meaning you participate from home. 
and all of you around the world listening, and, and there are like 60, 70, 80 countries listening to this right now, you can all participate. If you're new to plein air, there's a basics beginner's day, and uh, you're going to love this. It's going to have a lot of fun for you. It's, you're going to have a chance. There's no airfare, no high expenses. Anyway, uh, go to plenairlive.com and get signed up. It's coming up in July, July 15th, and the beginner day, the 14th, so get on it. Uh, plenairlive.com. Reminder to get your best paintings in before the end of the month for Plein Air Salon Art Competition. Okay, that ends on the 30th. And to win a seat to the Plein Air Convention or the Figurative Art Convention, you got to get that in by the 30th as well. And just go to streamlinegiveaway.com. And that, uh, if you win, we'll contact you. All right. If you've not seen my blog where I talk about art and life and other things, check it out. It's called Sunday Coffee, and you can find it at coffeewitheric.com. This is always fun. We'll do it again sometime, like next week. I'll see you then. I'm Eric Rhodes, publisher and founder of Plein Air Magazine. Remember, it's a big world out there. Go paint it. We'll see you. Bye-bye. This has been the Plein Air Podcast with Plein Air Magazine's Eric Rhodes. You can help spread the word about Plein Air painting by sharing this podcast with your friends. And you can leave a review or subscribe on iTunes so it comes to you every week. And you can even reach Eric by email, eric at plenairmagazine.com. Be sure to pick up our free ebook, 240 Plein Air Painting Tips by some of America's top painters. It's free at plenairtips.com. Tune in next week for more great interviews. Thanks for listening. <laughs>